Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, thank you for joining us on this lovely sunny day uh, for, the, for today's talk by the artist Lee Kai Cho. Uh, my name is Wendy Tio, and I am Senior Lecturer in Modern and Contemporary Asian Art here at the Portal. Um, and this is the second um, Asymmetry Distinguished Lecture Series, second of our events, um, uh, co organized, of course, with the Asymmetry Art Foundation. Uh, so the talk today is uh, titled Espionage and Disposable Lives, and of course it could not have come at a better time, as some of you will have seen on the news uh, just last week, two British men who were arrested and accused of spying for the Chinese government here in the UK, and four others were accused of the same in Germany. And incidentally, the topic of espionage is also uncomfortably tied to the institutional history of the portal itself, as some of you know. Uh, one of our former directors, Sir Anthony Blunt, artistic advisor to the Queen, and one of the most well-known British art historians of the last century, was in fact also a Russian spy, a member of the infamous Cambridge Five. Spies are everywhere, it seems. As a literary theorist, Alan Hepburn wrote, stories of their various exploits tend to crop up in periods of geopolitical turbulence. Spies recall dissonance at the heart of ideological certainty, he wrote. The narratives of intrigue they generate allow us to engage our political imaginaries and to speculate on the ever unstable nature of statehood and citizenship. And it's on that note that um, I'm very thrilled to be able to welcome Lee Kai Chung to the portal to share this fascinating research-based uh, archival practice on this topic. Uh, Lee is a fantastic artist whose work centers on unveiling the complexities of human nature, concealed histories, transgression, and agency. Uh, he has exhibited very widely. Uh, most recently, uh, his work was included in the Sharjah uh, Biennial 15, Thinking Historically in the Present, uh, in 2023 and Wandering Walking at uh, Guangzhou Asia Culture Center in 2023 as well. Uh, Lee has established numerous online archives as part of his practice, an extension of his personal research and collaborative projects um, and publications. He was awarded honorable mention at the Shah Jao Daniel to, uh, uh, 15 and the Taoyuan International Art Award in 2023. The Robert Gardner Fellowship in Photography from Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology of Harvard University in 2022. The Altheus Fellowship from Asian Art, uh, Asian Cultural Council in 2020. And the award for young artist from Hong Kong Arts Development Council in 2018, among his many achievements. Um, so today, we will be sharing, uh, talking about his archival methodology and sharing excerpts from his video work uh, based on his research into uh, secret agents and intelligence operatives in British Hong Kong and Morocco during the Cold War. Um, and after this talk, um, we will be inviting questions from the audience. Uh, we look forward to your participation, followed, uh, followed by uh, drinks uh, just a little bit down the floor. Please join me in welcoming Kachi. Thank you so much for um, coming to to the talk and sharing. I would rather put it as a sharing in this very uh, warm and sunny day and, and spend the like one and a half hour with me. So uh, I would like to, uh, it's my true honor and I'm humbled to be invited to this talk series. And thank you so much for Asymmetry Foundation and also the Control for like supporting artistic uh, research and also the expression, uh, freedom of expressions. So, um, my name is Chong. Uh, I would like to briefly introduce myself. I am a di diasporic uh, artist, originally from Hong Kong. So, I, I, I moved to, uh, uh, yeah, I, moved, I moved to London uh, a year and a half uh, ago. So, um, my, my passion in historiography and also geopolitical um, dynamics be began with a coincidence. Like, Day back in 2014, um, by the time there were a lot of uh, social movements in Hong Kong, so I, I came to aware that I need to look for more materials apart from the second hand, uh, secondary source material, 
right, such as books or newspaper. So I spent some time in the post-colonial archive in Hong Kong. So I would rather put it as a post-colonial archive, like because um, Hong Kong has been handed over back to like the sovereignty has been transferred back to China in uh, 1997. So. Um, I, I start to um, came to aware that uh, the post-coloniality of archive and also, also like the underlying power dynamics of archive, like what is the capacity and also the limitation of archives in historiography and also the transparency in, in information in civil society. Um, I believe like today I will share um, a very recent project called Tree of Benevolence. Um, some like part of the work is about espionage or activity of intelligence or agents, but um, I'm not quite sure I, I have the capacity to share a lot of like, technical information or um, operation of like, espionage because <laughs> like, uh, I spent quite a, lot of time, not quite a lot of time in the past like, uh, working on archives, but now I'd rather spend more time on um, talking to people like how to work with people, like what is the affect and what is the emotion being suspended. So um, especially for this topic, intelligence, I am not quite sure I can, I have the capacity to get access to the material. So, um, but I, I can share a little bit of my, my experiences working with people uh, in this project and also how I derive from um, some of the people that I'm working with and um, presented in a uh, form of art. Um, I may give a little bit of background information about my, my practice. In the recent years, I've been working on a series of research-based projects under the theme of displacement. Um, in, in the context of English, displacement always like, direct to um, dislocation, people being forced to, trans um, to migrate from one place to the other. But in the Chinese context, it's more ambiguous like because Chinese um, also embedded a lot of information into very minimal um, capabilities. So um, I want to explore the capacity and also the possibility of displacement in the Chinese context. Uh, what is being dislocated, um, the psychological and mental status of um, the people um, that displaced. So um, I think day back in 2017, I started to work on a research about um, uh, an imaginative, um, imaginative mega infrastructure called the Greater Asia uh, Railroad, which connects um, almost like most of the um, countries uh, in the East Asia from Japan, like just because of the war. So um, some foreign uh, European powers want to animate their power and colonize uh, countries in Asia. So they started to build railroads to connect all the countries. So, but later in the Second World War, the, Jap the Japanese Empire of, J Empire of Japan um, uh, occupied some of the areas and tried to develop such a mega infrastructure in order to connect like ideology, um, geographically and also ideologically. Japan, uh, the Japanese want to construct a new idea of Asian, like uh, the subjectivity of Asian in the Second World War. So, but after that, like, some of the rail, railroads were abandoned, and some of them they're being um, uh, refer, uh, refurbished into the other railroad. So, um, this huge project um, constructs, uh, like, contributes to me uh, as, a, as an itinerary to conduct field research. At the same time, I try to divide these railroads into sections and uh, work on some particular featured projects related to a particular section of the railroad. So, but um, for these particular projects, um, Tree of Benevolence, um, like day back in 2021, I, I started to pay attention or like work on fragmented research about the politics of nature, well, natural resources and natural environment, which has been used, capitalized, and objectified uh, in the pursuit of modernity and also geopolitical uh, interests. Uh, some of them that are being used by the colonial powers um, in the uh, early 20th century and until now. Like because like those material, um, those nat uh, natural resources being 
objectified as a tool to govern the local people. Um, especially after the pandemics and lockdown, that pushed me to come up with a way not to act against, but think with our senses, embodiment, and our habitat. Um, so today, like Tree of, of Benevolence, is um, I think it's about a project um, of intelligence called War and also Beyond. Um, like, like this project, Tree of Benevolence, actually is under like a bigger topic or bigger project called the Cold Mountains, which concerns China's the use of special positions of the South, like which is like Guangdong Province. Um, during the Cold War and also the use of Hong Kong to build international relations and facilitate economic recovery. Like the mountain, the mountain became a hidden frontline base. On the other hand, from the perspective of the, of the mountain, which has been a holy mountain for the indigenous religion, such as the Taoist, and also it served as a refuge during the, uh, during the warfare, the plague, and also natural disasters people fled into the mountain to search for haven and also shelter. So I consider the mountain as a self-healing um, system like compared to a human-centric perspective. So, um, but for Tree of Malevolence, I try to use a uh, rather human-centric perspective to look at uh, its relationship with the nature and also the self. Um, Tree of Malevolence is inspired by the life stories of intelligence agents during the Cold War in Hong Kong and Southern China. It's a research-based pro uh, project that unveils the complexity of human nature and also individual struggle un under collectivism. Um, I, I started to work on this project, I think, um, day back to 2018. I came, I have an opportunity to in interview an old lady and later, like after a series of interviews, I came to where she, uh, her family uh, was, um, both of her family, father and mother, was working for um, the Chinese Communist Party as uh, underground, undercover um, intelligence agents. And I, like for this topic is so complex. And also, I I'm not I was I'm not able to, um, like my gut feeling to tell me, I cannot really work on it because it's so complex. And also, I have to work with, work with people, especially I cannot disclose their uh, identity and also a lot of information I cannot get used uh, get close get access to. So um, after a few years, and there's an occasion that tell me maybe I can transform it into something else, just because of what is happening right now in the UK and also in Hong Kong and also in China. So, um, there were um, a few parallel but forking paths like leading to the same destination that uh, urged me to work on this project at this very moment. Um, like very, in very recent, I learned that my, my mother survived the Cultural Revolution in China, like, and also the mass clashes uh, in the 60s in, in China. So um, her weakness, her experience, and her, like, uh, the way that he re as she recalled her experiences buried a seed in my mind. And also, um, I, like, recently, like, just because what is happening in the society, I, I recalled um, the old lady's um, testimony and also the content of the in, uh, of the interviews. Um, I feel like there are a lot of um, this is not a particular case. The many uh, many people, the collective, incarnate in me. Sita Yasi It's him, her, it, as well as you and me. Um, at the same time, I, I believe that some of some of you may have heard about um, the situation in Hong Kong, like um, Article 23 um, is a Hong Kong security law, um, a law that sabotaged the freedom of speech and also dismant dismantled human rights by authorizing unrestricted power of law to the enforcement departments. Like if there's any allegations such as espionage, 
threat of um, state secrets and also external interfer uh, interference. Like uh, the law will exacerbate a further exodus of Hong Kong people. Like a lot of my friends, like started to migrate to other countries, um, uh, especially for my friends working in the creative industry and also journalists. Like it forces me, it urges me to think about what is the coldness of Cold War. Like because, like recently, I believe many people um, try to um, talk again about Cold War. Are we in the Cold War? Even though there are a lot of Cold War happening right now around us, the coldness in the social norm refers to the substitutions of military clashes for other forms of non-liberal. Confrontations such as arm breaks. But at the same time, it's our peace is temporary and frozen. Um, I, read, I read about like, many researchers and also discourse. They emphasize this on the dichotomy, like the polarization of international powers. I ponder what is the Cold War influence on the mundane individual level? What uh, the people think about it. What are their experiences? What about the uh, humanitarian and also affective perspective on Cold War? Is the academic research or about the discourse try to delink us from humanity? Like, even though we have a lot of spe speculations on intelligence agents, like how the agents expose or try to steal the secrecy of the state. The secrecy is being fabricated and also per perceived as a spectacle. But on the mundane level, all the people, including the agents, the mass, they are being mobilized in the social movement. Are we strapped to bear lives in the eye of the authority? How people, human, is degraded, diminished as an abstract concept. So um, I think and it just like forced me to think what is the power or what is the capacity of art to delink such pain, uh, such logic. Um, I think in the following uh, presentation, I will try to play some of my video that I just made. And um, I, I fabulate, I try to fictionize um, some of the content or research that I acquire from uh, no matter my interview with the old lady, and also I read about the other people's experiences and also the speculations, and try to reflect on like, how people, like normal people, think about intelligence. Um, I use six historical events, like which are the events in, uh, involving spying activities in Hong Kong and southern China, try to thread through how the humanity being involved, that uh, how the complexity of humanity being involved. In the film, a secret narrator, an agent known as Y, mumbling to herself in the shadow of a multi-channel video installation. Um, the narrative is fragmented, intertwined, but they are life stories of human beings. Um, those stories, they happened being took pay, uh, taken place between 1940s, like ever since the, by the end of the Second World War until 1960s almost the peak of the Cold War. Um, this is um, yeah, the installation shot that I, uh, installation that I just had in Hong Kong uh, in by the end of March. Um, they played like they played on CRT TV like the old style TVs. Um, so now I'm, I'll try to um, there are six channels but I, I, I may try to play three of them. So um, so we I can open up, like we can open up more discussions after um, the screening and also my explanation. This is the first one, leave Hong Kong for the time being. By the end of the Second World War, Britain was deeply concerned about its inability to defend Hong Kong in the Far East, like by the time like, Hong Kong was still a colony of, uh, of Britain. Meanwhile, the political turmoil in China caused the civil war that affect the sovereignty of the colony.
係左定係右？我搞唔清楚。我哋學會唔去知。Constitutional reform allowing more local Hong Kong Chinese representative into the council and also the government. The proposal was known as the Yang Plan. But uh, yeah, recently I, I went to our LCA to see the show um, Entangled Passes. I, I, I realized um, the governor, Mark Yang, was from the Yang family, which many of the family members they were sent to the colony to be the, like governor. So that is like colonizing family from UK. <laughs> um, on 19th January ni um, 1949, like the, the Communist Party issued a mo mem uh, mo memorandum on, uh, on the democratic uh, affairs, which did not recognize the co uh, capitalist countries and also their embassies, including Hong Kong. The border and also the sovereignty issue of Hong Kong has always been a hot zone between different powers. Why, uh, which is the narrator in the film, was able to travel between uh, the borders, which, uh, the borders between uh, Guangzhou province and also colonial Hong Kong, just because of her identity and also her missions. Um, she was a member of the East River Column and anti-Japanese guerrilla group fighting hand-to-hand -hand with the CCP, Communist Party Army. Wai's daughter, who is the old lady that I interviewed, was, both, uh, was born in the war, precisely in 1938. By the late 1949, the CCP Army took over Guangzhou. At the time, there was a discussion among the officers in the CCP army, liberating Hong Kong from British imperialism. But there were still uh, other concerns, so that's why they, they suspended that idea. After the establishment of New China, Beijing has yet to establish proper international relations with um, other countries. It needs to capitalize on the special position of Hong Kong and Macau, which both of them are still colonies. On the other hand, senior British officials did not reach a consensus on the Yang plan, tried to um, invite more Chinese representatives into the council. Just because um, the officials from Britain, they expect there will be lead to a strong opposition in Beijing, which may prompt, may force, urge CCP army to take over Hong Kong by force before 1997. Therefore, after both sides balanced their interests, the British government took the lead in recognizing CCP regime 
in the international. While CCP established an, an agreement with British, leave Hong Kong for the time being. Long term planning for the maximum utility. And that is the second um, clip I'm going to play. In April 1955, some ex colonial countries, such as India, Malaysia, Indonesia, after the Second World War, they tried to um, try to help, uh, try to hold a bank, bank then conference in Indonesia. And CCP regime, which I will put it just simply as China, was invited. Many of the participating countries was later known as the Third World. I would like to clarify, historically there were two Chinas. One is like the CCP regime, the other one is um, Republic of China, uh, sorry, um, Republic uh, of China ROC, which I would rather put it, that, that is under the regime of nationalists after the Second World War. So I would rather put that simply in like China and also Taiwan. Um, the Bandang Conference was an important in the, in the narrative of Cold War in Asia, just because it later led to a non-allied movement, which means those third world countries neither joined the East or the Western bloc. There was a, an assassination happened in Hong Kong by the time when the Chinese delegation, uh, including the premier, the premier, Zhou Enlai and other important CCP officials, when they departed from Beijing, traveled to Hong Kong, and later take another transit plane, which is Air China Princess Kashmir, to Indonesia to attend the conference. Um, the assassination was um, related to um, United States CIA and also Taiwan intelligence because they were believed uh, to be in charge of the assassination. And this clip may last a little bit longer, um, around 10 minutes. Hai 我在門收入科時期就已經在吳先生管理的交通方工作主要負責在打放區建立聯繫網絡下屬叫他做老闆聽聞他在北宋理學家周敦兒的後代我習慣了稱呼他做先生五個英文拼音是W開頭 如此類推,我的代號是Y。就是這樣,我有時姓魚。無論是吳定是魚,都是我的意思。我們是第一人稱的復數。我們都是無名。
學過啲英文。先生外訪嘅時候，我通常會以外語傳譯員嘅身份出行。九五年四月十一日，潮湿，远方有薄雾。嗰一次出行万隆会议之前，佢话需要做一个艰难嘅决定。原本以为佢指嘅系而家同苏联关系僵持，急需喺微苏之外揾其他出路。所以万隆会议系一个重要契机。同亞非拉嘅第三世界國家組成聯盟。喺上飛機前，先知道行程臨時有變，我哋坐咗另一班機先去緬甸，再轉飛印尼曼隆。遠遠睇住，原本我哋乘坐印度航空專機，拍十米二公主號，點解？新華社嘅隨員同我兩個外國記者，仲會上嗰班機嘅。佢嘅右手早年受傷，無法完全伸直或者彎曲超過四十五度。佢習慣將右手大概一百二十度咁放喺前面，手指微微彎曲。好似輕輕吊住馬鞅咁。黑十米二公主號喺啟德機場起飛之後五個鐘，機艙爆炸起火，喺印尼對開海面撞毀。佢哋耶加達只係仲有個半鐘頭嘅航程。冧曬。喺緬甸落機嘅時候，佢故意放慢腳步，俾當地記者影相，好似咩都冇發生咁。原來外交部琴日已經收到英國軍情局處嘅情報，點解佢唔下令取消航班？咁佢哋喺登機之前就已經知道。一九五五年四月十二日，天下，我哋抵达会议会场之后，确认咗系对家军情局一九五五部队落手。因此，因为牵涉到印度航空，同场嘅印度代表团神色尴尬，先生更加谈笑风生，在场都唔知有几多人揾佢签名留念。佢比平日張揚。萬隆會議第一日活動完結之後，印方即刻揾咗機會向先生澄清，並安排同佢哋隨團嘅情報人員 R N c a r 會面。会面嘅时候，卡尔英语交谈，先生其实英文讲得好流利，佢事前已经吩咐我照常传译，佢面露好似白纸一样轻薄嘅微笑，佢用意究竟系咩啊？Conference, in fact, was very crucial and timely for for China, just because um, when China involved in the Korean War, it was being sanctioned by the international 
uh, the other countries. So China has to seek for other possibilities and also other alliances apart from the Eastern and also Western bloc. Um, but by the time uh, when I get to this piece of information and also this incident, I, I wonder, is it a planned, uh, planned crash or um, is a planned assassination to the uh, Premier, Zhou Enlai? So um, I, like, I believe the video like, narrates like, what, what was happened in, in the incident. Um, after the conference, um, China won the international reputation and also the sympathy and put CIA and also the nat uh, Taiwan nationalist regime into a very embarrassing, situ uh, embarrassing situation just because the Air, uh, Air, Air India uh, aircraft, the Princess Kashmir was uh, in fact um, manufactured by the US. But the people, like they are um, the representative, the delegations uh, of China, they are still board uh, the plane and also they died in the assassination. In such dehumanization, the bare lives they can be disposed after their functions are exhausted. I would like to play the third video, which is about um, why as the protagonist of the story, she was assigned it another mission to take charge of the first ever urban greening project in China, which was held in Guangzhou. Um, by the time in, in the mid-1950s, there was a new trade fair called Canton Trade Fair. That was one of the first trade fair open to international traders and business people. Um, in this square, which I think like some of the officials appeared in the first video, that is the square that uh, where the Canton Fair and also the exhibition hall were built. Um, I would like to play the video, which may last for five, six minutes. Hang 
，成為咗港英政府認可嘅辦公室。黃家會嚟到第三屆，舊年第一屆喺中蘇友好大廈舉行。事到如今，有咩嘢比友好更加諷刺？开放咗俾外商参加交易会，要入广州，香港系外商嘅唯一入口。佢哋喺九龙站坐火车去广州之前，会喺弥敦道办公室进行最后审查。十七條的意見裏面提出，十二年內喺一切可能嘅地方，通通按規格種樹，實行綠化我係林業部嘅書記，負責廣交會起義路陳列館對出嘅海珠廣場綠化工程，同時監察外商同本地人之間有冇任何不正規交流。人山人海，有一種最最不安嘅躁動。最可怕嘅唔係泄漏行蹤，而係發覺身邊路人太似路人，或者嗰啲所謂嘅同僚，隨時都會出賣我，啲都睇唔出。呢次我故意用上另一個代號，人未如。三搭石，光明磊落嘅磊，總有一日，我可以活喺陽光下。常端咗嚟揾機會嘅人，做生意嘅同收集消息嘅人都喺裏面。有啲人識幾個英文單字，就落力向外國商人推銷可以兑換人民幣嘅黑市外匯券。揾唔到機會嘅外省人，啲錢使曬又買唔起火車票翻鄉下，就會喺海珠橋下面露宿。廣場瀰漫住一啲唔健康嘅氣味
目睹欣欣向荣，寄生喺人嘅躯壳上。每个人或多或少，好似宿主咁，被抽干养分。嗰年我向上面提出申請，匿埋揾個地方生咗個女。之後幹部話要將我個女交俾佢哋，我個女會交俾邊個？佢哋話會送到香港，日後有用。港邊會安排人照顧蘇亞，嗰人將會係我嘅丈夫。就係、是、咁，我輾轉往來香港同廣東。佢可以唔跟我姓，我喺書面向黨委申請，但係佢只可以有一個名。十六歲之前嘅友誼都仲可以相信，一旦過咗十六歲，就千祈唔可以信任何人。我一字不改咁教我個女。阿女喺五零年小學畢業嘅時候，喺紀念冊第一頁上面寫住：孤獨是最壞的，一同。多人就可以做得更好、更出色，永遠不要離羣獨處，佢應該互相幫助。風珠、耳籍、下土，究竟要幾多邪念先可以栽種出樹？嗰邊嘅花王，我好似喺邊度見過佢。我過去望一望。I believe we we don't have enough time for for the other videos, but、uh, I would like to round up my presentation. <laughs> Sorry. I, I flew back to Hong Kong like earlier this year to try to meet a um, uh, wife's daughter um, to uh, acquire her consent and also to confirm all the details before exhibiting this project. Um, we caught up and spent hours going through the details. Um, wife's daughter, she is still in her 80s because she was born in 1938 and she is almost in like, 90 years old. I feel extremely grateful that I can maintain a friendship with this very elegant old lady. I use Y as a code name um, in substitute for uh, the full name of the agent in the film. Uh, in fact, like all the names in the film is fictional. Her full name was written on her daughter's primary school graduation album, which appeared in, in the film and also for this one. This is the, like, the first page of, um, of the album. Like, that is a very Chinese thing. Like, we, we wrote that kind of album before graduation, so we try to give the other people a piece of very good memory. Um, the old lady that I was facing like, when we are confirming the details she asked me not to disclose any of Y's true code name because the code name is still in the record of the CCP intelligence department and also the National Security Bureau in Hong Kong, which the code name may endanger anyone who knows about this piece of, his, uh, piece of information. I realize I get closer to the violence of archives and the fear is still among us. 
by the end of the meeting, wife's daughter told me I make a mistake in my film. Why? The full name, the fictional full name, is not a real name. Because like, by the time, like day back in 2018, I interviewed her, um, that name was written on the album. And also, her daughter told me that is wife's um, real name. The daughter, the old lady told me that is a fake name. Even though we do not know which name is real, the nameless is a representation of the violence. But at the same time, nameless try to protect some of the people in the shadow. So um, I I hope I have more time to play like all six channels of the videos. But um, I, I would love to open up more discussions if that's possible. Thank you so much. So much that was really fascinating. I'll just give you a minute to <laughs> to take a breath while while the audience thinks of some questions for for Kai Chung. I'm sure you've got many. Thank you, thank you, Kai Chung, for the experience. Uh, Fantastic. And uh, I have two questions. At first, uh, I'm wondering, could you elaborate more on the uh, the figure of tree, or why you choose the title tree of um, and evidence? Um, and uh, as far as I know, because I Google it, it stands for uh, 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 some sort of fictional, uh, some magic from from anime or something. Yeah. But I didn't find really the exact um, source of it. Um, and the second question is, uh, could you, could you uh, speak a bit more, or, uh, uh, speak, uh, a bit more about the, the, the narration, the, uh, the narrative, um, and the, the story told by a uh, narrator herself? Um, and how, 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 to what degree is it fiction now? To what degree is it real? Because I'm, I, I have a feeling that. Um, it's a fantastic story and fantastic delivery of story. But at the same time, um, if I, I feel think, think to consider it from a kind of meta level, the espionage, the spy herself is actually quite unskillful, or unprofessional in a way. Because I feel that uh, all our put it in, in, uh, put it in uh, another way that. She, at least in the film, she's showing her most fragile moment because she's firstly the camera is constantly looking at something directly and tentatively uh, and, and, and with, with a kind of uh, intense attention. At the same time, there's a high there's a high contrast uh, image that's uh, the only thing on the foreground show and the background just fade away into darkness. And that kind of attention and intense of emotion, intense of narration, telling a kind of a, a straight line style of stories, actually very dangerous. And um, um, it's not, it's just not the case in espionage work. And I feel this kind of contrast is very interesting kind of working there, because on one hand, there's, there's something, I would say, it's some kind of Oedipus. Uh, at Oedipus, and not not even cosmic context, but the data Oedipus, the Oedipus that Colin has that. It's as if kind of she knows she's in, she's kind of being trapped or kind of plotted, being plotted into something she could never comprehend. But this, but she, she could only, the only choice of when you get to the, the kind of a single string to her secret burial, then why, as far as know, she like died at the end of the film. And I feel like, yeah, just, just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, the kind of the pairing of the, the image and narration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, maybe I can answer the second questions first. Um, really, uh, we are concerned about the professionalism of espionage or spies. But in fact, um, from my experience or, or at least people that I encounter, um, some of them they are well trained. Some of them they're just ordinary people. 
there are different levels of espionage. Like, for example, some of them they engage in um, uh, being a bodyguard of important officials, or some of them they are informants. They just provide information, or some of them they just like take pictures and then send it to a WhatsApp group. <laughs> there are like various kind of, um, or some of them they don't even consider themselves as part of espionage. So um, um, I think the reason why I use a first-person perspective to, to film and also why I use Super Egg Film, uh, why I handheld the whole, like throughout the whole film, um, I think partially because I want to present um, my embodiment to the imagery, like how my body can affect the, the visuals, how my um, my perception or interpretation of the sight, of the event, of how I recall the memories of the interviewees can affect how I perform video, uh, like uh, filming, like the whole process. So I kind of put it as an incarna incarnation of myself into filming. Um, and also, I don't like um, a film being too clear, like, high definition, like that, that kind of transparency, like just put me into um, question whether is that the case they back in the past that, like for example, if a spy wants to film something, they must use like some small cameras or with a very tiny film such as Super 8 um, to film the whole process. So like shaky imagery, um, like grainy imagery that may be the case day back in the past. Um, so that's why I, like, how I proceed this film. Uh, I'm not sure I answer all the, your, your questions. Like for the first question, uh, questions about the name of Tree of Malevolence, this is from my personal fetish of a Japanese animation, Yo-Yo uh, Hachiko. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's a very like 90s um, Japanese anim uh, comics. In the comics, one of the protagonists, she, um, uh, he, had a weapon, which is a tree. The tree will feed on a person whenever the person has like wicked thoughts. So like the, the like the evilness will feed as a nutrient to the tree. So the tree will bind to the person and they grow together forever. Um, when I revisit the interviews, like the, the story, life stories of the old lady, um, and I witness what was happening in the homecoming also, like in the activities of intelligence and espionage, I realize sometimes we do not um, realize we commit um, Evil doing. Like even though I, I just mentioned that maybe we sent a picture to a WhatsApp group who already contribute to some evil doing. Um, that kind of banality maybe will cause a very, very bad consequence to other people. So the tree may feed on some unaware wicked thoughts of us. Um, and also, just because the centerpiece, the third um, video, which was taken place in a square, a greenery uh, project in, in China as a camouflage for why to conduct her mission. So I make use of the imagery of tree and also how we plant the tree with our thoughts. Uh, that's why I put the name as Tree of Malevolence. Thank you. Hello. Um, I was quite interested about what you said about arbitrary violence. Um, and I was wondering whether you see that as a sort of positive type of violence, so containing dangerous information, or whether it's more of a negative type of violence, one that's linked to erasure and disposability in most cases. Thank you. Um, I think the violence is the case that um, when I sit with um, the old lady, 
like we have to go through all the details and I confirmed like which piece of information that I can um, use it no matter in a public scenario or in the work or how I construct my narrative related to this piece of work. I still recall a situation when uh, like I and also my galleries, we reach exhibit in Hong Kong. Um, by the time it was just the time, just the moment that the national, um, the Article 23 was um, enacted. And we have to have very close communication with the, the art fair and also the organizers. We will be violent any kind of the law because there's no boundary for the law. And maybe we have already like commit a crime of showing the artwork. I'm not. I'm not trying to say that like um, we are trying to expose any information that not support maybe hurt the benefits or interests of the nation or the state. Or like, because I, I do not think I acquire any important information. Those are life stories of people. But. If we think about like there are some information records being stored in the archive that we have no access to it, which may endanger our safety whenever we try to like travel back to Hong Kong or China, that is the violence that puts the fear on our mind. That fear may last forever. Like once I, I still recall um, a conversation with my friends in China, like we know our like our conversation records on WeChat has been uploaded to somewhere. That is the archives, and we know it, but we we don't know the consequence of archiving. That is the fear. I love all the films, and in a way, I think it's actually made it, it made it easier to get into the narrative and the history. And I also have a comment. Uh, I also have a question about regarding the Hong Kong presentation because I saw it, and I feel it's more. It feels more emotionally charged in a way. Like it felt like they're like material witness presented at a court. And I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more on. Yeah, the formal decisions we made at this um, presentation. Thank, thank you. You've seen the show? Oh, no. Thank you so much. Yeah, I know your name. Claire. Claire. Thank you, Claire. Um, yeah, by the time um, I was invited to an art fair, like, to be honest, um, that, that was just my gut feeling. I, I, I never thought that I would exhibit in an art fair. But at the same time, like I, I try to uh, suspend the thought that like art fair is just a place for selling and buying art. Um, so I try to think with the context of fair. Like how can I make a work inside the fair that like part of the work is about fair. So a Canton fair a video about intelligence activities carried on, like carried within the fair. What about I, I make a fair inside a fair? Um, what about like the audiences, the visitors? In fact, they try to look for something that they can keep into their records. Um, thank you, Claire. It, 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 you, you make me recall I mean, just to like raise one example, like recently when we print any publication, because like part of my practice is about making publications. Um, when we print a book, no matter there's a leaflet or a small booklet or artist scene in Hong Kong, um, all the information, including the, um, like the publisher, the artist, the writer, or the, the designer, all the names will be sent to the National Security Bureau. Um, are they taking records? I mean, the visitors. Sometimes I have a little bit of 
precarity, like if the visitors, they, they try to document something, but I have to get rid of that precarity. So um, that's why I, I put, yeah, yeah, I, I, I one more detail. Um, from uh, on the back of the image, like there's a black and white like wall sticker by um, at the end of the, the space. That is that was me, but uh, that architect, uh, uh, that building, that architecture. In fact, it was um, a cam of special a special branch, which is I, I would say like national security bureau um, during the colony. Um, uh, it was under supervision of MI6 and MI5. So, like before 1997, uh, like political um, uh, prison, uh, prisoners, they were kept inside that camp. So, on the wall, there's no door sign, there's no number, there, there's nothing, there's no feature. You cannot really tell what is inside, behind the walls. Um, uh, in 2014, I tried to come up with a series of work called um, History of Riots. So I, I reenact that someone tried to follow that person in the photograph um, outside the camp um, from the perspective of maybe a spy, maybe a police officer. So um, yeah. And, and also that, that series, series of work was the first time that I exhibited with another independent art space called Parasite in um, Abbaso, Hong Kong. So um, that is uh, a little, little bit of my personal preference to recall um, 10 years ago, I, I have been there. <laughs> Thank you. Presentation. I have a question about the relation between you as the artist and um, the character why you created King Films. Because I feel like she um, she existed in multiple layers. She's both um, the mother of the old lady you met and a main um, in archives, and she's also. Oh, she's, she's a real person, but she's also someone who created um, in the work. And for me, um, in the film, she felt almost, she felt a bit, um, she felt like she's one of those disposable lives. And she didn't stand out for me as a per person with actual flesh and bones. Um, so I wonder if that's a, if that is, an, is a creative decision you made consciously, and whether you think, you think that your relationship with her, whether she's a character, a real person, or you know, names in archives, whether you think that relationship itself is inherently violent. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Um, that's, that was my struggle as well. So, um, um, Ethically, I cannot, I literally cannot um, use all the materials that I acquire from the interview, which uh, who is like Y's daughter. So the character Y actually is a, is a composite, is like a accumulation of many, many people, including my personal um, imagination or fabulation. Um, so sometimes, like, why was being very professional on her mission? Sometimes she, why, is a mother of a daughter. So the mother tries to educate the daughter how to live a very tough life during, uh, after the Second World War and also in Cold War in Hong Kong. And sometimes why is a very um, authentic human being. Um, she has her own struggle. Um, so I, I think that is the process that I try to combine all the beings that I encountered in the process of researching and also interviewing um, and put it into one 
uh, fictional being called Y. Thank you. Uh, I'm very a general question. Take a step back from the recent work. Um, the question is uh, what, what, what do you think uh, the relationship between uh, your artistic practice and uh, history or historical events? And I think because not only from this work, but from the previous work, I think it's quite obvious that he, he's been drawn to uh, history, and not necessarily more historical, uh, historical events, but not just also just um, uh, certain uh, images uh, that he saw in history. And he also mentioned the word archive a lot. And actually another thing another thing I noticed is that uh, on your website in your bio you just say that you are a human form. Um you also think you perform um you perform artistic research um history or something like that. Um so the word form there. Uh, really took me when I read it. Um, and I understand it's kind of a big question because of what I understand what is really interesting about this work, for instance, is that it's on the one hand you have this um, um, set of historical events which, as you were introducing the work, as you were giving a, a context to it, you you talk about these uh, events in more sort of informative way, which can sound a bit dry. <laughs> um, and I know that you, you also tend to include uh, a lot of these attacks on your website, but next to uh, um, uh, next to the work. Uh, but when you actually show the work, uh, it's, it's, it's entirely different, even though it's kind of like there's a parallel between uh, the previous uh, instruction slightly uh, and this new image that we all see. There's, there's, there's just something much more dynamic in the in the latter, in the in that new image. Uh, that, and that dynamism is almost um, kind of adequate to the kind of dynam dynamism of history that you're trying to uh, uh, capture, not necessarily, because that, that is the question, because I was going to say capture, but what would you, how would you characterize this relationship between your work and uh, history? Thank you, Etienne. Um, yeah, I, I, I always, but to be honest, I always struggle, like, oh, what is my position? And what is my relationship with history? Uh, sometimes I have to say like um, I research with uh, I research records in archives, and also I think about the historiography and, and also about the power, power dynamics of an archive. Like the, I would put it as the metadata of archive, like why they're being constituted and presented in front of us in in this way. And like what is hidden underneath in the, the material instead of the content. So I, I yeah sometimes I, I being I was being a naughty boy to perform the archive like try to act against the narrative. So that's why I use the word perform. But at the same time, I try to animate it. Like I try to um, because by the time I spend. Um, Loads of time with like the piles of materials. At the same time, I I, I ponder like where are the human beings like apart from the materials? Like who are they? Um, what do they look like nowadays? Um, so in my work, and also I, I know the capacity of um, research. I 
and also artwork. Like I cannot like just a, a glass cup. I cannot put everything into the cup. Um, so I, I I would say in the artistic presentation, um, in most of my work, I would rather focus on um, the effect, like how people reacted to this world and and they think with um, this world and also the uh, geopolitic uh, geopolitics and I would rather focus more on human beings in my work um, but like I, I have to say that like, in, in most of my time I work with my collaborators and and also um, on the other projects like such as like publications like public programs, like online archives, uh, things like that, like which may not necessarily be presented in the exhibition. Um, that is the thing that I really, really in love with because to be honest, I, I'm not the only one work on research. In most of the time, I have a lot of very good collaborators and mentors to work with me. So, um, I mean, like, also, like, art projects, I have other collaborators, too. So, I'm, I shouldn't be the only one being credited. Um, yeah, so, um, sometimes I'm very dear to history because it serve, always serves as a starting point for my, like, impulse. Like, why I want to tackle this historical event at this very moment, just because it's happening here, it's in front of me. So that's why, like, my, my, my methods is just like I collect a lot of materials and I put them into different files. And if the time comes, I will just like take it out and work on it. So I sometimes I have multiple researches like going, like, happening at the same time. Um, but at the same time, I feel like I'm a phantom, like, because I feel like I have to keep a distance from events, historical events, in order to have more reflection onto what is happening right now. So I'm, I'm always in a struggle, like pull and push. I want to get closer into the events. I want to get, get closer to the, the people that I work with. But at the same time, I have to step back because technically I have to think about how I can present the work at the same time protect my my collaborators. Um, that is my struggle. Always has been my struggle. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kajin, for a brilliant response to a, to a challenging question on history and archives. And <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Um, so perhaps we can continue this, uh, this conversation more informally over drinks down the hall. Um, but please join me in thanking Kajin Thank again. Much. Thank you so much.